Hello everyone, how are you going? And welcome back to some more Historica Canada Heritage Minutes, with this one being the new Heritage Minute with Jackie Shane. Long way from Nashville to Mama, I'll tell you that. Performed from Montreal to Boston to Los Angeles. But Toronto, that's my chosen home. Sure, when I'm walking down Young Street, I see some funny people who have the nerve to point the finger at me. And grin and smile and whisper. My song was number two on local radio. Sold 10,000 in Toronto alone. Whoa. Turned down Ed Sullivan because they asked me to remove my makeup. Wouldn't do American Bandstand because of their segregation policies. I was just being me. Never tried to explain myself to anyone. And besides, none of that don't worry, Jackie, because I know I look good. <laughs> Got a new way of loving, baby. Thought I want to teach it to you. Jackie Shane was a pioneer transgender soul singer, a central figure in the Toronto R&B scene. Wow. She helped shape what we know as the Toronto sound. Wow. Well, that is certainly a slice of history that you would be very proud to have. You know, you look at some of these photos and of course the Heritage Minute does so well in terms of just the representation and how they portrayed the original person. But look at that. Just look at all that glitz and glamour almost of that jacket. I even loved it when they said that they were asked to remove their makeup, but they said, oh, I look too good for that. I can't be removing my makeup. Don't be try to change me in any way like that. And so even though I will admit that I don't actually know who this person is, or I, I guess I didn't know who this person is prior to this video, it is amazing. You can really see that they were very popular having number two on the record uh, the record list and then also selling 10,000 in Toronto alone my song was number two on local radio number two on local radio for anyone to be on local radio just making and charting it's always just a massive deal let alone the fact that they ring it up at four dollars you know that is four thousand times ten thousand just in Toronto alone and so I can only imagine that they did quite well for themselves oh actually interestingly enough Jackie was born in the USA and not in Canada I just expected everyone that is going to be prominent in a heritage minute just to be born and raised in Canada but no they were just became popular in Toronto but that's where the connection is. I mean actually listening to it again they do say it's a long way from Nashville and Mama and somehow I just didn't make the connection and was thinking I mean, I don't know what I was thinking, but I just didn't make the connection that that's where Jackie was born. And then on top of that, it is pretty incredible that this entire Heritage Minute is set in 1967 because when I searched it up, it said that Jackie was born in the 1940s and so to be a massive soul singer by 27 is its massive feat in its own right. But honestly, overall, you can do nothing but just marvel at the confidence and just the bravery of Jackie just in the 1960s and I can only assume the 70s and 80s and continuing on just to be, like they said, just Jackie being Jackie, being herself. Because as they mentioned in the Heritage Minute as she walks down the street she's going to have fingers pointed at her but really they're going to be fingers pointing for so many different reasons because this is the 60s and so if nothing else this really showcases how you can separate a person from an artist if someone is just good at what they do they can sell 10,000 records in Toronto alone but would they have been able to do that if every one of those 10,000 knew exactly who they were it would be definitely interesting to know because it would be such a limiting factor in personal life but when you can just explode in your artistic life then ah it's incredible to see but anyway now moving on to our second one even though it isn't an official Heritage Minute. I reckon all of these are great. So we have the Inuk author who championed the Inuit language and culture. I am an Inuk woman. I never went to school. I learned from my parents, my Anana and Atata, about how to survive, what kind of animals to eat, what to do in severe cold, and if you eat country food, it will keep you warm. I learned to write in Inuktitut syllabics. I wrote over 20 books about Inuit culture and traditions. Wow. Some are still being taught in schools today. Wow. I was the first person to write a novel in Inuktitut. It was called Sana. It's about a family who lived our traditional ways, but was forced to live like we do now. I wrote it to preserve our traditions for the future generations. I tell them. You will not be sorry if you keep your language. You will be sad if you forget those ways. Make sure you remember your traditional ways. Oh, 2007. Wow, 1931. Writer, artist, teacher, mother, and grandmother. That is an incredible life, just covering so many different aspects and facets as well. Just like she was saying, just writing 20 books, some of which are still being taught. I mean, I didn't even know any of them were being taught, so that's incredible in its own right. I mean, I would love to know where she actually grew up as well, because obviously this entire Heritage Minute showcases a very Arctic and very polar kind of climate. They even talk about the kind of country food to keep you warm, and of course it does. I mean, that's just a way of life. That's the only 
the way people have survived for thousands of years just by eating particular types of food. Does it say where she actually grew up? I mean, you can buy the book. That's incredible. Booktopia. It's sold so many different places. I wonder how many copies it's been sold. Born in, oh, actually born in 1931 near this place in Quebec. Where is this place? That is northern. Whoa, that is north. I'm just looking at this image over here and I saw a little red dot all the way up the top. Where did it go? Okay, it's not as high as I thought. I thought it was up in the true, true north, but it is still in Quebec. But where did that dot go? I guess if I just zoom in, we'll be able to better see it. But there we go, right there. That is pretty north. Or how many degrees north is it? Uh, 30, yeah, 36 degrees, no, 61 degrees north. But even reading something like this, you know, during winter when the tides are extremely low for whatever reason, I don't know why winter affects the tides, but local Inuit sometimes climb beneath the shifting sea ice to gather blue mussels. You're climbing beneath the ocean just to go and get food. That is some seriously hardcore stuff. And so even though I can only assume that her original novel has been transcribed into many different languages, especially if it is available on all of these international book sites, really just having that heritage and having that history and just ability to look back on this culture from, like I was saying, the 1930s and 40s and maybe even 50s would be an incredible resource to have, especially almost 100 years or 90 years since she was born. But anyway, now moving on to our third one, we have the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Despite the steady wages and the adventure of travel, the work was not easy. We left our families for weeks at a time, sleeping no more than three hours a night. Porters were at every passenger's beck and call. We had no identification to wear. When passengers wanted your attention, they just called you George. My name's not George. In 1943, we joined the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. For the first time, we had job security, reduced work hours, increased wages, and above all, some dignity. Later, the Brotherhood negotiated, and finally each porter was issued two plastic name cards placed in wall holders at each end of the sleeping car, inviting passengers to call us by our names. Ah, oh, see, that's an incredible story as well. It's almost like one of the first unions that I've ever heard of. And even just to have that, like they said, just respect, just to have your even own name be called that instead of just some random name that people don't even know what to call you by. Even that is just a massive change, let alone everything else that just would have developed through that. And it really is an incredible story that you don't really hear much about. I mean, especially these days, they aren't really a thing. I mean, yes, rail is still a thing, but intercontinental rail, is it really a thing? I mean, I guess for a very select few, and so the entire demographic graphic or the entire population that is involved in anything like that is very slim. Whereas I'm sure as everyone knows, back in the day you weren't flying and if you weren't walking you were basically catching the rail and so it was a massive industry and so just to be having these thousands I can only assume of workers just being treated like that, like like they were saying, maximum three hours sleep a day just functioning and that's your entire workforce and your entire life. I mean obviously this is only one story but I can only assume Stanley's is one of like I said thousands and the fact that it was 98, that is an incredible life as well. I mean I can only assume that that he wasn't a porter for 98 years because it would just be so taxing. I certainly hope that, wait, when was it? It was 1940. In 1943. 1943, yeah, okay. So early 1940s, to be having that kind of a change from the 1940s would have been huge. You know, obviously like the first Heritage Minute that we just watched, that was 1967 and this is the 1940s. And yes, in terms of some particular aspects, it would have been an awesome job to have just to be traveling the countryside via rail, taking in the scenery. But when you actually look at the fine print, you realize, oh, I have to sleep a maximum of three hours a day. I'm at everyone's beck and call, they're going to treat me like utter rubbish constantly. Just, I can only assume the kind of names and everything that would have been called out constantly as well. Let alone your own living conditions are going to be so poor as well because you're not going to be given the five star treatment like everyone else and you're away from your family for weeks on end. And so even though I can only assume that it would have been a major uphill battle for any kind of union to be formed, the amount of reform and change and just respect that it apparently or supposedly brought about would be incredible. Like they said, just from being called anyone's name or I guess George just treated like an object to even just the respect of your own name. But anyway, now moving on to our fourth one, we have Pierre Falcon, the songwriter who helped forge a Matisse identity. I composed my most popular song after the Battle of La Grenouillère. That was when the big fur trade companies were fighting for control of the territory that we lived on for generations. We, Métis, Les Bois Brûlés won the day yeah. and I wrote a song telling of our victory <laughs> nice when I sang at the campfires others would take up the tune we sang while we worked we sang as we fought to keep our land 
and we sang when so much was taken from us. I wrote many songs. We made t-shirt stories and news by talking and singing. We have always sung songs like this, and I think we always will. Wow, enduring anthem for the fight for the Matisse national identity. Oh, look at that, 1793 to 1876. This is certainly no modern history in the grand scheme of things of heritage minutes, but my goodness, it really has a lasting impact on the modern day, doesn't it? And so when you hear a story like this, you can absolutely understand how it would have helped forge a Matisse identity because so much culture and heritage and history is just being lost and wiped out instantly, you know? After living and working and nurturing the land for thousands of years, all of a sudden, in the span of 100, 50, maybe even less, you were just getting completely everything just turned on its head. But there is one thing that always amazes me and something that I have such respect for and that was the fact that Aboriginal people from all over the world, whether it be Canadian Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal, like I said, internationally, they always have the ability to carry so much culture through song. It's incredible. Like you said, they have it around the campfire, they have it when they work, they have it in so many different elements that it just becomes a part of life. It is such an ingrained cultural activity and it's incredible in that regard. And honestly, the fact that they were even able to win some of these battles just blows my mind. You just think about the kind of scale that they were working on and these empires just coming over and pouring resources into it because they're getting a lot back out but the fact that these guys were just able to go out there and win these battles just blows my mind I don't really get it I guess if nothing else what they lacked in resources of population and money and all these other things they just gained in so much knowledge of the land and so of course you almost turn into just like secret service warriors of your own lands and so I guess even though obviously not every single battle was won and there was still a mountain of scars left behind from what occurred during those times at at least these songs just do provide that little bit of a standing point for where and how a Mati can help forge their identity. But anyway, in saying that, I reckon I'm going to call it there. So thank you for watching this video. If you did enjoy it, feel free to do the YouTube algorithmic things down below. Also, if this is the first video of mine that you are watching, then make sure to go check out any other ones I've done. Also, make sure to go check out all of the original videos down in the description below. Or hey, maybe you even just want to consider subscribing so that you don't miss another one of these in the future. But all in all, have a good one and see ya.